So this first video on artificial intelligence touches over the concept of intelligent agents. An intelligent agent is basically, well, an agent is basically a program or a thing that can do other stuff, right? So for example, an agent might be a poker playing program. An agent might be a robot, right? An agent might be a vacuum cleaner uh, that, that does something, right? So an agent is this entity that does stuff, right? And an intelligent agent has um, an intelligent agent has sensors that get the input to the main routine that determines what it's going to do, and then this routine tells the actuators what to do. Now, in a in a robot, right? There are sensors: temperature sensor, light sensor. Uh, uh, a GPS is a sensor, all those kinds of things. And actuators are, for example, the arms of the robot or the things that the robot can move so it alters the environment. It moves or it moves things away or it moves itself. Now, the sensors come from the environment, right? And the actuators perform actions on the environment, right? Or in the environment. Now, we're going to call the things that the sensors can sense, we're going to call those the percepts, okay? And then what the actuators do are the actions, okay? So again, an agent is basically a black box where percepts come in through sensors, then some program, right, uh, does whatever it needs to do with the sensors that tell it how the environment is configured, and then they um, affect actuators that result in actions in the environment. So now, for example, let's take um, the following example. A, a vacuum cleaner, okay, a vacuum cleaner that is, um, that needs to know which room to clean, room A or B, okay? If it senses that the room is dirty, it will suck, right? If it senses that the room is clean, it's going to try to go to the other room. Now, um, let's look at the at the percepts of this of this uh, vacuum cleaner. If it perceives that it's in room A, and room A is clean, all right, then it'll move to the right to room B. If it perceives that it's in room A and it's dirty, it will it will suck the dust the dust, right? Now, the same thing if, it, if it's in room B and it's clean, then it's going to go left to room A and so on and so forth. Now, what happens, though, is that sometimes intelligent agents perceive things in the environment several times before they can take an action, right? Or So, for example, it might perceive it at any given point in time, you know, it moved to room A, for example, and on second one, it perceived that it was clean. It was ready to go back to move to room B, but somebody dropped a glass, and in its in the transition, it perceived that room A is dirty. So, for example, it perceived that room A was clean, and then immediately before doing anything, it perceived that room A, uh, I'm sorry, it perceived that room A was clean, and immediately it, it perceived that room A was dirty. Then it's going to stay there and suck the dust. If it perceives that room A is clean and in its way to room B, it still perceives that room A is clean the command, the action that it'll take is to go right, right? Now, it might be that it perceives a bunch of things while taking that action. So it perceives that room A is clean, so then it starts to go right. Then it perceives that room A is still clean while it's going right. It still perceives that room A is clean. And as soon as it's about to go to room B, somebody dropped a glass and it perceives that room A is dirty, then it stays there and suck, and then it goes back to sensing again, right? <clears throat> Another uh, sensing thing, it might be sensing that room A is dirty, so it's sucking the dust, but there's so much dust that it will perceive the sequence of perceptions might still be A comma dirty, A comma dirty, A comma dirty for a while before it can perceive A comma uh, dust, right? A comma clean, right? So there's the perceptions, whether there's dust or not, and there's a sequence of perceptions, a sequence of, of percepts, right? And it might act, the, the agent might act on a sequence of percepts, or it might act on a single perception, okay? Now, let's do some considerations for intelligent agents. 
some of the considerations that we need uh, as, as uh, programmers or as designers of intelligent agents need to take into account is how is this agent going to act, okay? Is it going to be moving? Is it going to be doing something else? Is it going to be talking? How does it know that it's doing what it's supposed to do? So how is the vacuum cleaner know that it's actually cleaning the room and not just, you know, going around and, and having no effect? How does it know not to make a mistake? So, for example, how does it know not to clean a clean room, right? In the case of the vacuum cleaner, how does it know uh, if it's... Um, if it's a robot, how does it know not to trip on an electrical cord, for example, right? Now, the other thing is, should we monitor this agent at all times? So, for example, a robot that is trying to um, defuse a bomb might need uh, constant monitoring just in case, you know? Um, perhaps a, a, a dialogue agent like the, that that you find in some smartphones that talk back to you, right? Sometimes, perhaps, we want to know what it's doing every so often, just so we know that, that the dialogue is working correctly, right? Now, what happens if it's put in a different environment? So, for example, what happens with the, with the dialogue from the phone, right? If you put it in an environment where people have an accent that is not the accent that you trained the dialogue for. What happens is if the robot that, um, <clears throat> if the vacuum cleaner now is put on the outside, right? What is it going to do? If it's put on grass, for example, I don't know. What happens if we move it, we move the agent from uh, to another environment? These are all considerations that designers of intelligent agents have to have. Now, one concept that I think is key for intelligent agents is that of ra uh, rational agents. Rational agents, uh, a rational agent has to do with doing the right thing. Okay, and how do you know that you're doing the right thing? Well you use what's called a performance measure, okay? A performance, me a performance measure reports how desirable was the agent's action. So, for example, the agent did something and you measure a performance. Was it a good thing to do? Was it what the agent was supposed to do? Was it desirable, okay? That's the performance measure. So, for example, you put the vacuum cleaner on a dirty room and after it sucks once, you measure, well, how much dirty or how much, how much cleaner is the room after the vacuum cleaner sucked the, the dust, right? If it's cleaner, how much cleaner? Is it like just a teeny tiny bit more cleaner? Perhaps the agent's not very good, perhaps not a very good vacuum cleaner, or was it good and the agent actually hit the dirtiest spot first and, and got, you know, some, um, some dirt out? They're performance measures, and these performance measures report how desirable was the agent's action. Now, rationality depends on a few things. As we've been talking, it depends on the performance measure or the, uh, or the criteria of success, right? Or the criteria of success. So what I'm going to say, when this, I'm, by looking at this performance metric, at some point I'm going to say, <clears throat> this performance is so good that I consider this to be a success. I'm going to move on to something else. So the vacuum cleaner, at some point, perhaps there will always be dirt in the room. But at some point, the performance metric measure is, there's so, so little dirt that I cannot even find it. So then I'm saying, you know what, that's success. For example, um, whoops. Then uh, the rationality also depends on the agent's prior knowledge of the environment, right? So whatever it knows from the environment will help it do the right thing, a desirable action. So for example, if it knows that there is a uh, area of the floor that is black, it might ignore it for, uh, it might not take it, it might not confuse it for uh, dirt, for example, right? So the knowledge of the environment does help rationality. Then the actions that the agent can perform also affect the rationality of the agent. If the agent cannot suck, well, it might not be able to do what's desirable in a dirty room, you know? If the agent is a, is a sweeper, for example, but it cannot suck and there's something that it cannot be swept, right? It might not, it might not do what's desirable, it might not clean the room. Uh, the rationality also depends on the agent's uh, precept sequence to date. So whatever has been observed to date might dictate what the agent does next. And we're going to see an example of this, for example, in the game of chess, where whatever the actions have been so far affect the next move. 
if I move certain pieces first, that will affect the future of the game, right? Now, let's look at the task environment of an agent, okay? Um, there's a framework to define this task environment. It's called the PEAS. So if you have, if you know the agent type, okay, say for example a taxi driver or something else, right? If you know what kind of agent you want, P will stand for performance measure. So you need to define what's going to be your performance measure. E stands for the environment. You'll have to define what's the environment in which the agent's going to move. Um, A stands for actuator. So what is the agent? What are the agents? abilities to change the environment, okay? What are the things that the agent can affect that will and that will result in a change of the environment? And then the S stands for sensors. So how is the agent going to perceive the environment? What are the sensors to perceive the environment, okay? And that's the PEAS uh, framework to design agents. So let's give an example. For example, a taxi driver. The performance measure, B, is whether it, how safe it was, how fast it was, how comfortable was the trip, how many, you know, illegal, uh, how many traffic violations were there, and how much it cost, right? So I have several performance metrics that combined will tell me whether this was an efficient and effective taxi driver or not. The environment, well, it's the roads, the traffic, the customer, the pedestrians, uh, bicyclist, everything, right? So that's that's the environment in which the taxi driver has to operate. What are the actuators? Well, the things that the taxi can affect so that they will change the environment are the steering wheel, for example, right? So if the taxi moves the steering wheel, it'll move to the right or to the left, and thus the environment will change. Uh, the gas pedal, so it can affect the gas pedal, effectively increasing or decreasing the, the, the velocity. It has a brake pedal, which will uh, decrease velocity. It can signal, right? So then lights will go off and those lights actually change the environment. It changed the behavior of the people behind me. It changed the behavior of the people crossing the street if they see that the car is signaling. Um, and again, other, other actuators like the horn and then whatever sign, you know, hand signs that the taxi cab can, can actually do. And how is the taxi perceiving the environment? Well, there, there might be cameras if this is a, a, an automatic ta a taxi driver, right? Th there might be cameras. There's a speedometer that tells the taxi how fast it's going. There's a GPS that tells it where it is located. There's an odometer that tells it how many revolutions uh, is the engine running at, etc. There's a lot of sensors that tell the taxi what is the environment configuration at any given point. Now, According to the environment and, and how the intelligent agents um, interact with it, we have several kinds of agents. There's, there's more than what I've listed here, but I want to talk about these ones at least for a while. The environment for an intelligent agent can be fully observable. That means that the sensors provide all relevant aspects of the environment, okay? I don't need anything else that's the whole thing, okay? Um, the environment can be partially observable. So where only some aspects of the environment are only some some aspects of the environment are known and many are not known okay which is most systems i would not most systems but many many systems in 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 that interact with the real world uh there are single agent and multi-agent um environments so if you think of a of a video game with many enemies, for example, right? That's multi-agent. Each enemy can be considered as an as an agent. Uh, the environment can be static or dynamic, meaning that when the agent is doing what it's supposed to do, right? The the environment doesn't change. That would be static. If the environment changes, then it's dynamic. Then the environment can be episodic or sequential, meaning that. Uh, the agent needs to observe the environment once to get the full picture. That would be episodic. Sequential means that the environment needs to be observed at every time, every every uh, at some interval, right? And then the sequence of observations will help determine what comes next. Okay. 
um, we're going to look into examples of all these of all these things. And then the environment can be discrete or continuous. Discrete means that the environment has set attributes. So for example, the colors of the environment can be red or blue, right? Continuous would be the colors of the environment can be anywhere between, you know, a, a white and a black and any possible color in between. That's continuous because there's infinite number of colors depending on on the on the RGB values that you give. Um, so let's let's look at some of the some examples of these things. For example, chess, playing chess. Chess is fully observable. All you need to know is the board. There's nothing else that you need to know for a game of chess, for two agents that play chess with each other. There's nothing else you need to know. It's fully observable. That's the environment. It doesn't matter. The room temperature doesn't matter. Whatever's going on outside doesn't matter. Just the board. It can be multi-agent if you think of programming two agents that play against each other, right? Uh, considering each player is an agent. It is sequential, it's not episodic, it's sequential, okay? Because the moves that you make, the previous moves, affect what you think the next move is going to be, right? So if I see that you've opened with a certain move and then you do a next move, then I know something. I know, you know, that this sequence of moves might lead to a future attack and I might be able to defend one way or another depending on the sequence of things that I've observed, the sequence of moves. It's a static environment. Why? Because when a piece is moving, when an agent is doing what it's supposed to do, which is move a piece, right? The environment, or, or thinking and then moving a piece, the environment is not changing. Okay? The board is still the same until the player took the turn. And it's discrete because there's only 64 squares on the, the game of chess. So any piece, any given piece can be in at most 64 places. That's it. Discrete. Okay, it's very well defined. There's no continuity here. Uh, a game of poker, right, is very similar. Similar, uh, it's it's discrete because there's only so many cards. It's static because when a player is taking the turn, the environment is not changing. Okay, so if I take my turn, people aren't changing their cards. The environment isn't changing. So when it's my turn, the environment it is what is what it is. It's sequential because I care what have been the previous moves of the other players. I care about the sequence. It can be multi-agent if you program several poker players against each other, but now the observability of this is interesting. It's partially observable. Why is it partially observable? Because when I am playing poker, I only know my hand. There's no way for me or for the agent to know the hand of the other players. I can estimate some probabilities of, of given hands, given the sequence that I've observed, but I cannot know for sure what are the other players' hands. So I cannot observe the full environment of the game. It's just partially. In chess, all players can observe the full environment. They all have access to the same board. In poker, the player only has access to his or her own cards, but not the other people's cards. Let's look at image analysis. So for example, looking at an image and detecting faces or something like that, or looking at an image and detecting a cat. Okay, it's fully observable. You can see the whole image. It's a single agent because there's only one intelligent agent looking at this image and determining what to do. It's episodic because I don't care what the sequence of images or what the movie was to get to that image. I just have the one snapshot of the image in this analysis and that's all I care about. Okay, <clears throat> it is static because what uh, when the image analysis is analyzing the image, right? Nothing changes in the, the colors aren't changing when the agent is analyzing the image, right? So it's static, the environment stays the same. Now it is continuous though, it's not discrete because although the image has a set number of pixels, these pixels can have infinite number of colors and that makes it continuous right away, okay? Colors can be in, in any spectrum of, I don't know, whatever, 64 million colors or whatever, but they're real numbers, okay? So the environment is continuous. Now, for example, if I have a butler robot, okay, the environment is partially observable because the robot has to move among the guests of a party or something like that. And it can only observe a few things. It doesn't know that, for example, somebody, that, that a kid is running and it's going to hit it. It might not know that, right? 
It doesn't know that somebody's going to drop a glass on the floor and the robot might trip. It might know, for example, what's immediately ahead of it, or it might have a, a range of vision. So the environment is partially observable. It's a single agent because it's the one robot. It is sequential because it cares on what, what's done before, right? So the sequence of actions that it's taken really affect what it's going to do next. So for example, if it's, if it's moving on a clear path, right, on a clear path for three or four seconds, well, it might continue to move on the same path because the chances are that it's still clear in second number five, okay? Um, it is, this is, and this is the big difference too with the others. It's dynamic. It's a dynamic environment because like I said, if four seconds in a row it's been moving forward, right? Most likely move uh, again would be forward because it seems like it's clear. But as it's moving forward, as it's doing, as it is doing what it's supposed to do, somebody might cross the robot. Something might change in the environment. The environment is continuously changing regardless of what the robot is doing. The guests are mingling regardless of where the robot is, right? And what the robot does. And it is continuous because the robot will move in a room, and if we think of this room as a coordinate system, it's, a, you know, it, it can have any, any given coordinates. It's not, the robot will not move from one spot two meters ahead. No, it'll move even in small, you know, in, in very small amounts too. Very large amounts, very small amounts, but it doesn't have a set, a set of anchors in the room. It can move freely anywhere in the room, and that's a continuous plane, okay? A continuous coordinate system, if you think like that. Now, another aspect of intelligent agents is how much intelligence is there, right? And I like to put this in terms of how much does the agent have to do with determining its next action, and how much did the programmer put in there to actually predetermine the next action. So let's look at a few uh, categories of agents. Now, these categories are not uh, mutually exclusive. Agents usually have a mix of uh, many of these categories, okay? There are simple reflex agents here, simple reflex agents. They're usually based on the input of the sensor, so the sensors tell you the input, and then they have a bunch of rules. So the programmer has programmed all the rules. In the case like, if the sensor is above 75, then do this. If the sensor is between these values and thus that value, do that, etc., etc. right? Maybe, maybe, there's some random behavior put in there by the programmer, okay? So maybe some of the deliberation is left for the, to the agent and not to the program. So for example, if this, if the sensor is above 75, but below 65, then you can take one of these two actions randomly, right? And that'll be a random behavior. So for example, if you're hitting a wall going north, then randomly pick between east or west, right? And that randomness there might be put by the agent and that might be a decision that is left for the agent. Uh, but simple reflex is basically a lot of rules all put by the by the programmer. Now there are model based agents and a model is how you think the world works and you put it in a model. For example, you can say the world works, works like this. You give people money and they give you goods. Um, that are equivalent to that money. However, we know that that is not exactly how purchases are made. Most purchases are made that way, but if you give money to someone and then you insult them, they might give you the money back. If you give money to someone and that someone gives you a faulty product, you give the product back and take your money, right? So there are a lot of complications, but a model is a simplification that helps us understand how some system, how some environment works. Therefore, because they're simplifications, they're usually model-based agents work in partially observable problems because they need to simplify. If they could observe the whole thing, you know, we have, might have a much more accurate model. Now, based on the input of the sensors and knowledge of the world, it can estimate, okay, it can estimate what the, what the environment looks like. Now, at each point in time, whenever it gets this information from the sensors, it updates the state of the world or the or what it thinks the environment is. 
rules are triggered after it knows the environment. And then here the smarts are shared. The coder can have a big influence on these rules, right? But there's a lot of, um, of smarts on the agent to actually be able to estimate the state of the world with the limited inputs that it has. And again, it might have some random behavior here and there, or non-deterministic. This word here, non-deterministic, means that given an input, it is not guaranteed that it's going to do the same thing uh, every time. So if, um, if you do something to the agent, right, or if it senses a, a specific temperature, for example, it is not guaranteed that it's going to react the same every time. Hopefully it'll do something that makes sense, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it has to do the same thing every time. Now, there's goal-based agents where the agent has a goal. Okay, for example, clean a room. And goals are evaluated by the system itself. The system will know with these performance measures whether or not it is um, attaining the goal. Now, based on the input of the sensors and the knowledge of the world, is going to evaluate the score. That, that's what's going to influence this performance metric. Again, just to reiterate, goals are evaluated according to sensors and, and the states, the state of the world. Okay, Rules are triggered. Again, the smarts are shared. And in this goal-based agents, because they evaluate themselves, usually there's more non-deterministic behavior, okay? Because, sure, there, there might be a rule, but because of it's evaluating the goal, and the goal might be all very close or farther away, or, you know, there's so many, the range of how close to the goal can be so wide that it's impossible to code rules all the time. So there's usually more non-deterministic behavior in this type of agents. Uh, there's also utility-based agents where the goals are evaluated according to what's called a utility function, okay? So how much utility? And that is a number. How much utility? That's a number. And that number can be many, can have many values. Usually these are based on the input of the sensors and knowledge of the world. The goals are evaluated according to the sensors and state, just like the other ones. Rules are triggered and the non-deterministic behavior is common. But the big difference between goal-based agents and utility-based is that the goals are evaluated based on utility functions. So it's not whether or not you clean the room, but it's basically up to what point it is worth keep trying to clean the room and leave it perfect versus, say, going back and recharge my battery. Okay? So what is more? what reports more utility to me? That I finish cleaning this room incredibly at the risk of running out of battery and not cleaning the room? or actually stop cleaning the room right now because it's okay and go charge my battery and then come back later, right? That's a utility function. It's not just goal-based. I will, I will evaluate my goals based on the utility that they report to me, the agent. <clears throat> Lastly, um, I want to talk about intelligent agents that can learn, right? And here the goal is always to improve the performance. Okay, so whatever the agent is doing, the goal is to do it better than you did last time, right? Or good at the eyes of a critic. They, these agents usually have a critic or an evaluation component that will tell it, you know, you're performing well, you're performing poorly, right? And every time they, they, they do what it, whatever it is that they do, they evaluate their performance, and then that evaluation retrofeeds the agent so the next time you can do it better. That's the critic. Um, they usually work with utility-based, right, with rewards or penalties. So rewards for doing it well, penalties for doing something uh, not so good or wrong, right? And um, one example, for example, of these is a problem generator, right? So, so something that will generate uh, problems for people to solve every time, right? Um, and while there are many, many learning, uh, learning agents out there, self-driving cars, um, Amazon, or any internet service that learns your behaviors and learns to offer you better and better things every time, there's a lot of examples of this. Now, some topics in artificial intelligence, which you might, you might find uh, useful, you know, are searching, game playing, probability of next actions, constraint satisfaction, structure representation. All these words might seem totally unattainable to you at this point because of the very introductory AI uh, lecture, 
but if you follow my videos or you Google these things and, and get videos on them, they will become more and more, um, more and more accessible to you. Thank you.